sing the chorus of O Come All Ye Faithful again. A cappella. We don't need a piano. A cappella. And then we're going to sing a second verse that says, For you alone are worthy. And a third time we'll sing, You alone, for we'll give you all the glory. So you alone are worthy, and then we'll give you all the glory, okay? Because you didn't come here just to hear a sermon. You came to worship. You came to express gratitude and praise to our Creator and our Redeemer, right? All right. So, O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come, ye, O come, ye to Bethlehem. Okay. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ. Okay. The chorus again only, for he alone is worthy. 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 Christ the Lord. We'll give him all the glory. 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 Christ the Lord. Father, we are here to worship you. We are here to give you all the glory. At this time of year when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, thank you for that gift above all gifts. Thank you for the gift of Jesus who brought us salvation. In his name I pray, amen. Believe it or not, uh, when I was in high school academy, I was part of the choir. I was only part of the choir by the grace of God and the grace of my music teacher, director. And every year, I was only in, at the academy for three years, but every year, at the academy, we would have a Christmas program. At the end of the Christmas program, we always sang the same song. We ended our Christmas pro program with the same song. It was called Ring the Bells, Oh, Ring the Bells. You may have heard of it. But in that song, the, the first verse goes like this. Ring the bells, ring the bells. Let the whole world know Christ was born in Bethlehem many years ago. Born to die that man might live. Came to earth new life to give. Born of Mary, born so low many years ago. God the Father gave his son, gave his own beloved one, to the wicked sinful earth to bring mankind his love new birth. And the, verse I, the, the line I want to focus on in that song is, born to die that man might live. Now, we are all born with death facing us, unless Jesus comes again before we die. But Jesus was born to die in a special way. And then a few years ago, I came across a song by a country music singer that isn't well known these days. Her name was Barbara Mandrell, still is. And she sang a song called, You Were Born to Die. And her verse was, goes like this. Jesus, baby Jesus, with a tear of love in your eyes. Jesus, sweet baby Jesus, you knew you were born to die. And I think sometimes at Christmas season, we focus a lot on Jesus, sweet baby Jesus, and innocent Jesus in the manger, and we should, and, and, and that's good. But we must never forget that Jesus didn't just come to be in a manger. He came to be our Savior. And it is true that he was born to die in a unique way, in a very unique way. The plan of salvation is beyond our grasp. I mean, we get the basics. 
we understand for the most part that we're saved because of God's mercy and compassion and grace because we have forgiveness of sins through through Jesus we, we, we get all that and yet there is so much to it we, we are told that the plan of salvation will be our science and our song throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity sometimes people say when are we going to get beyond grace and all that we will never get beyond grace even in heaven mark that down and so, I want to begin with a, a, a verse of Scripture from 1 Peter. And I want you to listen to it. It talks about Jesus coming in as our Messiah. But I especially want you to listen to the last sentence of this passage as Julie Thomas reads it. The prophet who spoke the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was this re revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Did you notice that? Even angels long to look into, and that means to understand the plan of salvation. How God could save sinners who deserve something else. They long to look into it, and we need to long to look into it. This will be a bit of a different sermon today. We're going to go through a lot of scripture. We're going to be pointing out some different things, and wait till the end, I'll bring it together at the end, okay? It's not first point, second point, third point, but points at the end to tie it all together. What we're going to do is we're going to look at some very interesting, similar things that took place at the birth of Jesus, and some similar things that took place at his death. We're going to look at some contrasting things that took place at the birth of Jesus and some contrasting things that took place at his death. And I'm not even able to cover all of them. I'll be covering ten things that were similar and, and three things that were contrasting today. And they're more than just coincidences, I believe. I believe there's something that we can learn from them. And so the first thing we're going to look at is that Jesus at his birth was proclaimed to be the Son of God. Jesus at his birth was proclaimed to be the Son of God. If we could have that slide, please. Okay? Notice Luke 1, 32. This is when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and spoke with Mary and told her what was going to happen. It's talking about the one whom she will conceive, it says he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The word Most High means God, right? He will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give him the throne of, of his father David. Mary knew what that meant. It meant the Messiah. And so, even before he's born, the proclamation is made that Jesus will be God in the flesh. Divinity united with humanity in ways that we will never completely understand. Then at his death, he was also proclaimed to be the Son of God. You remember when he was, after he died on the cross, you remember that there was a centurion there. And the centurion made the following proclamation. It says in Mark 15, 39, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in, his, in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now, it's one thing for the angel to proclaim it. It's something else for a Roman centurion who worships idols, most likely, who, who worships the emperor, who lives a life very much probably of quite a bit of debauchery. Roman soldiers were noted for that. 
It's one thing for an angel to proclaim Jesus to be the Son of God at a birth, announcing a birth. But to proclaim him to be the Son of God after he died, that's something else. Do you see that? Do you see the similarities? That's not all. There is also Mary's submission. After the angel told Mary that she was to conceive and, and that uh, what was to be born of her was of the Holy Spirit, Mary made this statement, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That was not an easy submission. Think about it. I know something that Mary knew, but not completely. Mary knew that that could possibly mean that people would think she was nuts. That would possibly mean people would write her off. That could easily mean that her family would want nothing to do with her. She knew that Joseph could abandon her. And if Joseph abandoned her and her family abandoned her, she would have nowhere to go. She knew that she could easily be rejected. And yet she said, it, let it be unto you, unto me as you've said. And so at his birth, there's Mary's submission. At his death, there's Jesus' submission. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He tells his disciples, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And he prayed that not once. He prayed that not twice. But he prayed that three times. The ultimate submission to God's plan for his life. At his birth, Mary submits to God's plan for her life that the plan of salvation could move forward. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus submitted to God's will that he is willing to experience death for you and me, that the plan of salvation might be in place. Jesus, Jesus know, knew that he was going to be rejected. He knew that he was going to be abandoned by his disciples, and yes, even by God, as we soon shall see. I want you to notice that Jesus was, Joseph was told to give Jesus a name, a name Jesus. And the name Jesus is important because it comes from the, the name Joshua, which means Je Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. And so the angel told Joseph when he was pondering what to do about Mary's pregnancy, whether to abandon her or not, the angel said, as Joseph was considering these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sin. At his birth, it's announced that Jesus is coming to save people, not just from Romans, not just from everyday trauma, not just from the difficulties of life, but more importantly, from the symptoms of all that. He's going to save people from their sins. And then on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for sin. He didn't pay it to God. He didn't pay it to Satan. He simply paid it because of the consequences of sin. We are all called sinners and we all deserve death. And Jesus took our place. So in Luke 22, 33 and 34, it says, When they came to the place called the skull, Golgotha, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. What's interesting about that is it says in the original Greek, Jesus kept on saying, Father, forgive them. I don't know when he started saying that. Maybe under his breath he was saying that when, when Judas betrayed him. 
Maybe under his breath he was saying that when his disciples abandoned him, when he was taken prisoner. Maybe under his breath he was saying that the whole time he was standing there before the Jewish leaders and then before, before Pilate. But certainly he was saying that as those nails were being pounded into his hands, Father, forgive them, Father, forgive them, and in the, into his feet, Father, forgive them. Because when Jesus was born... He was, it was announced that he would save people from their sins. And on the cross, he was making it possible for our sins to be forgiven. And then, at his birth, it was announced that he would be Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew 1, 22 to 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. One of the first sermons I did when I came here was a sermon about God's greatest desire. You probably don't remember it, but I'll tell you what it is in case you don't. God's greatest desire is to be present with you and me. God's greatest desire is to have a relationship with you and me so that we can have a relationship with each other. And so at his birth, it's going to say, it was told, you're going to, his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us, because he would be divinity in the body of humanity. And once again, I cannot explain it. I just know it to be true. He came so that he could touch our lives in, out of his humanity, so that we could touch God out of his divinity. That is a powerful thought. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And then on the cross, Jesus was forsaken by God. At noon, during the darkness, when darkness came over the whole land, and at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out. He'd been dark for three hours. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At his birth, he's announced as Emmanuel, God with us. At his death, he announces God has forsaken him because he's experiencing the second death so that we don't have to. Do you see the connection? That's not all. At his birth, Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes to protect him. Luke 2, 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. I don't know about you, but for years, I thought that meant he was born to a poor family and they just took rags that were found in the, near the manger and they wrapped him in those because there was nothing else to give him. It's not what swaddling clothes are about. Swaddling clothes were used for every baby that was ever born at that time. Swaddling clothes were linens that were prepared, and probably if you were more wealthy, you'd have better linen, okay? But swaddling clothes were placed around the baby for three purposes. Duh, number one, to keep them warm. Number two, they, they were used to pr protect them so that they wouldn't kick and, and, and hurt themselves. And also, in those days, they were also used to make sure that the baby's legs stayed straight. And number three, they were used as diapers. Mary was simply taking care of Jesus the way any mother would take care of her children to protect them so that they could grow and, and, and be, be whole, so that they could be healthy. At Jesus' death, they stripped his clothes from him in order to shame him. Matthew 27, 28 says, They stripped off his clothing and placed a scarlet robe on him to make fun of him. More than likely, that scarlet robe was just placed over his shoulders. It wasn't covering him completely. And we know from history that when Romans crucified someone, they didn't have a loincloth around them. They were there to be seen by all in all their nakedness in order to be 
put them in as, as shameful a position as possible. At his birth, Jesus is protected by swaddling clothes. At his death, he experiences shame when his clothes are taken away. It's not all. I want you to notice, when Jesus was born, the light of angels filled the night sky. Shepherds were in the fields near Bethlehem. They were taking turns watching their flock during the night. An angel from the Lord suddenly appeared to them. The glory of the Lord filled the area with light, and they were terrified. An interesting side note. There is good reason to believe that the shepherds in Bethlehem were watching the sheep that were used for the sacrifices in Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? But at his birth, the night sky is filled with the light of angels to help them know and to reveal to them the birth of Jesus. At the death of Jesus, it says that the darkness filled the midday sky. Mark 15, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At his birth, God was revealing that Jesus was there. At his death, God was concealing Jesus from the taunts and the ridicule of common people. And Jesus was there to face the results of sin by himself. At his birth, it was announced that Jesus would be king of the Jews. Remember the story of when the Magi came, and the Magi in Matthew 2, 1 to 2, it says that after he was born in the days of Herod the king, behold, three wise men came from the east, and they came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. They recognized that the one they were seeking was to be king of the Jews at his birth when he's just a baby, when he has nothing to offer, when there's no way, he's not born of regal parents, he's not born of a, of a kingly heritage, immediate kingly heritage, and yet they were willing to announce that he is king of the Jews. At his death, at his death, he's sarcastically referred to as king of the Jews. John 19 tells us that Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That, that sign was there for two reasons. The religious leaders asked that it be put up, that he said he was King of the Jews, and Pilate, to get back at them because he, they had forced this issue upon him, said, no, I'm just going to leave it the way it says. He's the King of the Jews. It was to be a sarcastic statement. But also, that sign was put above every criminal to say the offense for which they were being killed. He was being killed for treason. Not treason against Caesar. Jesus died because of your treason and mine. Because of our rebellion and sin against God. At his birth, he was called King of the Jews. At his death, he was called King of the Jews. At his birth, Jesus was worshipped. Did I skip one? Where did I skip one? I think you're one. A little bit. Ahead. I don't know how that got mixed up. It's gotten mixed up somehow. Can we go to uh, Jesus was worshipped? At his birth, Jesus was worshipped. Okay. Jesus was worshipped. Matthew 2.11, those, those same mag Magi came, and they came, and it says they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. These men, who were heathen in the Jews' eyes, these men who weren't spiritual in the Jews' eyes, they come and they worship him, a baby in a manger. At his death, there is mocking worship. Mark 15, 29. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross, save yourself. 
In the same way, the, thief, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He said, saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At his birth, he was worshipped by foreign, foreign philosophers, foreign students of, the, of nature. At his death, he was mocked by religious leaders in the crowd. I want you to notice that also at his birth, he was given myrrh by the, by the Magi, okay? And I'm not going to read the scripture, it's there. But we know that they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And those three gifts were symbols of things that would be received by a king, the gold. By a priest, the frankincense. And by someone in death, the myrrh. Representing Jesus is a prophet, a priest, and a king. At his death, his body was prepared with myrrh. His body was prepared with myrrh. I want you to notice that Joseph of Arimathea, a religious leader, at great cost to himself, not just financially, but to his reputation, came to take the body away. And Nicodemus, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight, a great amount of money. At his birth, the gift of myrrh. At his death, his body was prepared with myrrh. I want to go back to that slide about, uh, I, somehow my notes, it got lost, but it got taken out. But I want you to go back to the slide about Mary's sorrow, because this is an important one. Mary's sorrow. When Mary took Jesus to the temple to be dedicated, Simeon was there. Remember that? And standing, and so the, the one previous, oh, okay, Mary's sorrow. Simeon was there. And Simeon announced that pain and sorrow would torture would, her heart, remember? And at the cross, there it is. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is chosen by God uh, for the destruction and the salvation of many. And it said in verse 35, and revealed their secret thoughts, and sorrow like a sharp sword will break your own heart. At his birth, at that moment of joy, a moment of joy that every mother would have when that baby is born and comes out safe and whole, her heart, she's told her heart's going to be pierced because of what's going to happen to her son. And then at the cross... Jesus looks down and she sees, she sees Mary sobbing like any mother would. And he looks down and he looks at his disciple John. And he says, John, behold your mother, behold your son. He's there to take the sorrow away. Do you see the intertwining of Jesus caring for people's needs even while he's dying on the cross? He's there to take care of our emotional needs. He's taking care of our spiritual needs. And yes, he will take care of our spiritual, our physical needs. I want you to notice just a couple more. At, at his birth, a death decree was enacted. Remember the story of, of what took place after the wise men took off after an angel warned them to go home another way? when they intended to go and tell Herod that they'd found the King Jesus. And Herod gave a death decree when he saw the wise men had tricked him, became furious. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys two years old and younger in or near Bethlehem. This matched the exact time he had learned from the wise men. You see, Satan was working against Jesus. He wanted to stop Jesus from becoming the Savior. And so at his birth, he tries to kill him by having all the babies killed. Satan's trying to stop the plan of salvation from happening. But then it says, at his death, Pilate again asked them, what shall I do with the king of the Jews? Crucify him, the people shouted. And Pilate said to them, why? What has he done wrong? Shouted even louder, crucify him. Pilate wanted to satisfy the people, so he freed Barabbas for them. But he had Jesus whipped and handed him over to be crucified. At his birth, there was a death decree there was a death decree given 
for him to die on a cross. At his birth, the angels announced it to the shepherds. The angels said to the shepherds, and they appeared in that light and terrified them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. After his death, the angels announced his resurrection. Matthew 28, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. The angels announced his birth to shepherds. Angels announced his resurrection to women. Shepherds were of low estate in those days. It wasn't something you'd want your child to grow up and become, if you were looking at our society today. You'd choose another occupation. But back then, if your dad was a shepherd, guess what you'd become? You'd become a shepherd. It wasn't considered a good thing. They weren't trusted. And yet, an angel announces to shepherds that Jesus is born. And an angel announces to women who were not looked on very highly in that society either that Jesus is born. So what do we do with all this? Are these just good, nice trivia, Bible trivia facts of what happened when Jesus was born and what happened when he died? I think there's too many similarities and contrasts for it to be just a coincidence. I think God was trying to tell us something. I think what God is still trying to tell us is that without the manger, the cross doesn't matter. And without the cross, the manger wouldn't matter either. The cross and the manger are linked together in the plan of salvation in such profound ways that he doesn't want us to miss it. Do you, do you see that? I want you to think about how you celebrate Christmas and how I celebrate Christmas. We usually do it by buying gifts and getting all caught up in the hustle and the bustle and the, the parties and, and, and whether people will like the gift or not and, and do I have enough money for the gifts and, and we get caught up and yes, we do sing Christmas carols, but do we really take the time to look into the science and the song of the plan of, rede of salvation to be aware that it's not just about a celebration of Christmas. It's about a celebration of eternal life that Jesus made possible. And it was made possible through him coming to this earth, being born in a manger made of wood, and dying on a cross made of wood. It's not just Bible trivia. It's eternal life at stake. Second thing I want us to be aware of as we look at this plan of salvation, that the plan of salvation demands a response. Did you notice how many times worship was involved at the manger and at the cross, either by contrast or by similarities? Jesus being born in a manger demands a response. Are you willing to say, when God says to you, I will give you my Holy Spirit, are you willing to say, let it be to me as you have said? Are you willing when God says, I want to, I want to include you in my plan of salvation so that you can tell others who I am and what I've done for you, are you willing to say, may it be to you, to me as you said? I am willing to serve you in whatever way you ask. Are you willing to worship, to truly worship God? Will you figure out some way during this Christmas season to take the time to really sit and ponder and think about what it means that Jesus left heaven in the worship and fellowship of angels because he desires to be with us so much that he gave up his ability to be omnipresent and to be in human form throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. That was a huge 
gift. A huge sacrifice. We'll look at that more next week. As you think about the cross and the manger, this Christmas season, don't just think about sweet little Jesus boy lying in a manger. Think about the fact that he was born to die, that man might live, came to earth new life to give. Born of Mary, born so low, many years ago. Let us worship Jesus, who's not just king of the Jews, he's king of the universe. Let's just, let's worship Jesus, who's not just a babe in a manger, but he's a high priest in heaven. Let's worship Jesus, who lives and through his spirit dwells within us so that we can become like him. All right, please stand as we sing our closing hymn. It's